This sermon series is leading into something. It's leading into a reorganization of our fellowship, a reorganization of our thinking in terms of in terms of our community. Um, yeah, and not just to do church for the sake of doing church. We we I'm this kind of a guy who doesn't follow the the flow, the flow of the culture of law, the the church has its own culture in our country, in the continent. Uh, church has got its own culture and everybody follows that culture. Start a few people, you grow, you become many, and you start, you start fundraising to build a big hall. And you build a big hall. And after building a big hall, you begin to work towards filling the hall. And as you do that, um, your pastor is now becoming a celebrity. They need to drive the best car around. And so a committee is formed to organize for those kind of things. No, I don't use that kind of law. We are not going to do that. We will not do that. We have a very specific calling uh, in God through Christ to be a different kind of a community. Uh, we follow the Bible very closely. We want to follow the Bible very closely, not what the culture says. We want to follow the Bible very closely. God is interested in a community, in a missional community. He's not interested in buildings. He's not interested in what kind of car you drive. He's not interested in the, house, the kind of house you live. He's not interested in those things. You can get one if you want Go ahead and get one. But God is not interested in those things. Neither, neither do those things show that you have the presence of God with you. They don't. Not even a single bit. They don't. And we know that because we are surrounded by people who carry and have those things. But they are pagans. They are pagans. We know that. They have everything but they... They have pagans. We know that there are churches with the best buildings possible all over the place in the world, but there is no Christ in those churches. We know that. We know that. We know that some of the best cathedrals in the world are now converting to museums. Why build another one? Why build another one? They are now converting into museums. Why build another one? Why? There's no reason. Build God's people. That's it. That's it. Build God's people. We have just read John. John chapter 16 and chapter 17. What a beautiful, what a beautiful picture there of the people of God. And so we, we as a community, we are, we... We are trying to reconfigure our thinking, reconfigure our imagination of, of God's people. We are trying to reimagine, to reimagine what it means to be God's people. We are trying to do that. We are trying, trying to do that. And, and, you know, I've been in prayer. I've been reading the Bible. I'm now reading the Old Testament. I don't even know when we will start the, we are, when, when we are starting a new series on, on the New Testament, on the Old Testament. What? I'm seeing things I've never seen. Right there for the people of God. Things have, I started with Genesis and I'm reading slowly and slowly and slowly and I'm realizing there is so much wealth there. There is so much wealth for the people of God there. Spiritual wealth that we can learn from. And so I'm praying and immersing myself in scripture once again so that I, this vision may continue to be proclaimed. May continue to be proclaimed. Every single day. And those of us whom God will give a privilege to share the word of God here. To preach from this place. To share your testimony. Please make sure that your testimony and your sermon is about the word. It's about the word. And what God is doing in the world today. Through his word. That's it. That's who we are. And we are unapologetic. We are unapologetic about that. And so we have been doing a series on, on the spirit 
and discipleship and how the Spirit helps us to become a missional people. How the Spirit helps us to live a supernatural life. How the Spirit helps us to live a supernatural life in a world that is so broken. In a world that we are so broken ourselves, we can still live a supernatural life. We can still lead people to Christ even when we are broken ourselves. Why? Because we are admitted by the Holy Spirit. He has come upon us. He is the one who drives us. And we have seen that in Luke's gospel. We are in Acts now. We are trying to figure out, figure out that again in the, in, in the book of Acts. I've done a series on Acts before. And, and this time around, I'm seeing uh, things that are different from what I've seen before. And what the Holy Spirit was doing in the church, with the church, through the church, in those holy days of this community of Jesus Christ. We have talked about the ascension of Jesus and how the angel, an angel comes and he tells the disciples, get back to work. Stop staring at heaven. The one who has gone into heaven will come one day just like the way he has gone. So get back to work. And last Sunday, we looked at the replacement of Judas. We looked at the replacement of Judas. We looked at the question of suicide, something that uh, many Christians don't want to talk about, something that most Pentecostals don't want to talk about because they are, they are scared of it. They, feel, they don't feel comfortable to talk about these things. In this church, we talk about anything and everything. In, en in fact, I'm praying and I'm telling God, Give me capacity to be able to talk about anything and everything that is written in your Bible without fear. And so we will talk about anything. And we confront anything. We don't fear. We will talk about sex. We will talk about money. We will talk about marriage. We will talk about everything that uh, captures people's imagination in our day. We will confront it. We will masquerade. We will, we will come in and demystify these things that we carry with ourselves. And, uh, and they break us into pieces. And, uh, and because we, we, we always opt for them instead of opting for Christ. We will talk about them. I will not be scared. If you are in this church, you know that. You know there is no fear in this church. We will talk about anything. We will, we will talk about your idolatry without fear. If you are captured by the spirit of mammon, we will tell you that that is what is capturing you. If you are captured by the spirit of sex, we will tell you that is what is eating you up. If you are captured by the youthfulness and the pleasure and the, 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 the pleasure we are finding now in social media and in technology, we will tell you. We will tell you. We will tell you. We will tell you of your idols. We will speak about our idols until we we repent and turn away from the idols that run our lives today. There are people who cannot, who cannot think anything else. When they wake up, the first thought they think about is money. It's money. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. And these are people who speak in tongues in churches. Those are not tongues of the Holy Spirit. Those are tongues of demons. Because tongues have a particular purpose. I'm just going to show you, to show you that in the text today. So that's, that's the reorganization that we are going to, we are talking about. And soon we are going to gather as a family and talk a, a little bit about these things as a family. How are we organizing ourselves? So let's go to Acts chapter 2. We dealt with Acts chapter 1. Let's go to Acts chapter 2 and deal with a few things here. The first 13 lines. Let's read now, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a violent wind blowing came from heaven and filled the entire house where they were sitting. And tongues spreading out like a fire appeared to them and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were default Jews from every nation under heaven residing in Jerusalem. When this sound occurred, a crowd gathered and was in confusion because each one heard them speak 
in his own language. Completely baffled, they said, and these who are speaking Galileans. And how is it that each one of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Means, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia, Phrygia, and Pamblia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, near Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, and Arabs, even Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own languages about the great deeds God has done. All were astounded and greatly confused, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others jeered at the speakers, saying, the young drunk on new wine. That is what Pentecost is all about. That is what the original Pentecost was about. We have so many other small Pentecostals all over the place in Africa, but they come and they don't come anywhere near this reality. But we are told they are they are Pentecosts. We are told they are Pentecostal. When the day of Pentecost came, and that's the title of my sermon, when the day of Pentecost came, history was completely altered, as you are going to see. You see, we have already said Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. Jesus cannot leave you the same. You cannot be saved and remain the same. It is impossible. If you say you have Jesus in your life and your life has not changed, you do not have Jesus. You could be having a Jesus, but you do not have Jesus. Because Jesus changes everything. But that is also true about Pentecost. Pentecost changes everything. And that's what we are seeing here. Jesus, if you remember, and instructed the disciples to go back to Jerusalem and to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And you know, for centuries, the whole story of the Old Testament, the story that starts in Genesis 1 with creation, the story that starts with Adam and Eve messing up, the story that goes to Genesis chapter 6, and evil is now growing fast in the earth. And in Genesis chapter 6, we see angels coming down and having sexual relations with the daughters of men. And through their relationship, we find, we find giants being born. Being born. Evil continues to multiply. But the story continues to grow all the way to Genesis chapter 11. And we see the story of Babel when evil has increased so much. That now the people who God gathered to be his deputies are now building a city and a tower to go and to have some fellowship with God somewhere. That's how the story has unfolded by the time we get to Genesis chapter 11. And then God scatters them. It says there, it says there in Genesis Chapter 11, I think verse 8, it says, God scattered them from there across the face of the entire earth. And they stopped building the city. That means God will not be stopped by anything. God's mission cannot be stopped by anything. Listen to me. Guys, friends, sons and daughters, God's mission cannot be stopped by anything. You cannot stop it. And that means you've got to look at your commitment and your faithfulness to the mission. Because 
if you are not faithful and committed to the mission of God, we have just read in John chapter 15, you will be cut off. You will be cut off. The mission of God cannot be stopped. Evil and increased in the land. Men and women and grown. We even have giants now. Nephilims, they are called. And men are growing and women are growing and now they think they can operate against the mission of God. Genesis 11 Verse 8 says, God scattered them from, the, from there across the face of the entire earth. And that's what God can do with a church like this if we start to maintain ourselves here. If we start to think about ourselves in the, instead of thinking about what God wants done out there, God can easily scatter us. And so, he scattered them on the face of the earth and they stopped building the city. Verse 9 says, that is why it is, its name was called Babel. Because there, there, the Lord confused the languages of the entire world. And from the Lord, from there, the Lord scattered them across the face of the earth. Pentecost is about a restoration of this. It's about a restoration of this. Through Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, there is a reversal of what happened with Adam and Eve. There is a reversal of, of the corruption that emerges in the earth as sons of God in heaven come into daughters of men on the earth and they bear children with them. In Jesus Christ, there is a reversal of Babel. God scatters, disinherits the nations. But in Pentecost, through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the sin of Adam and Eve is reversed. The corruption that we see in Genesis 6 is reversed. And the corruption and the disinheritance of the nations we see in chapter 11 of Genesis is reversed. This is what happens or this is what happened when the day of Pentecost came. What happens in Acts 2 alters the course of history. It was only 50 days after the Passover. Jesus has been killed, buried, and he has been raised from the dead. It was just 40 days after he has been raised from the dead. He has spent 40 days with the disciples. He has given them instructions of what to do and, not, and what not to do in Jerusalem. It is 10 days after he was lifted from amongst them in Bethany and he disappeared into heavens where he is currently seated at the right hand of God reigning and ruling. And the small group of 120 were in prayer waiting in the upper room in Jerusalem. 50 days after his death and resurrection. 10 days after he has been taken away from them and give them instructions on what to do. And the disciples are waiting in a small room, upper room, in Jerusalem. And there, the Spirit came. We call that day the day of Pentecost. It is named after the Jewish feast of weeks. When all the Jews brought their first fruits into Jerusalem to be received by the priests. The feast of the harvest. That's the particular day when the spirit arrives in Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, the promised Holy Spirit came. Jesus and promised that they would receive power 
from on high and they would be his witnesses. That time had arrived. God's spirit, who is also Jesus' spirit, came and he radically transformed this small band of people, creating a community of witnesses. Creating a community of witnesses. The spirit comes for that purpose. When the spirit lands, he lands so that whoever comes in touch with the Holy Spirit, the community that comes in touch with the Holy Spirit is radically transformed to become a community of witnesses, of witnesses, a community of witnesses. I want us to remember that we are called by God to participate in his mission. We are called by God to participate in God's mission in the world to redeem it through Jesus Christ. But what we see a lot of time is people running away from the world and wanting to escape in some form of rapture and go away. That's escapism. God has invited us to, part to participate in his mission in the world. And how do we do that? By redeeming the world through Jesus Christ, the world's only true savior, Lord, and king. But this must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Each of us, each of us here is called to participate in that mission according to the gifts given to us by God through Jesus in the Holy Spirit. And so when the day of Pentecost came, the Spirit came. When the day of Pentecost came, the Spirit came. And this has serious implications for those who call themselves men and women of the Spirit. Serious implications. Serious implications. And so I'm going to talk about three implications. Three implications if you're writing. Three implications. Three implications of being filled with the Spirit. Three implications of being a Pentecost believer. I will not say a Pentecostal believer because that word means something else in our world today. I'm talking about three implications of being a Pentecost believer. To be a Pentecost believer is to exist together. <laughs> to be a Pentecost believer is to live together. Is to live together. Look at verse 1. At verse 1 of chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Look at those words. Look at those words. You know, you know these are inspired words. These are inspired ones. This is not like the song we are singing. This is the word of God. This is the Bible. This is, this is God speaking to us. Now, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now, let me, let me ask you, why is, why is Luke wasting his ink? Why can't he say they were all together? Why can't he just say they were together? Why must he use three words? Three phrases. Why must he, why must he emphasize they were all together in one place? Why must he do that? Why is he wasting his ink? You see, Luke wouldn't have said they were together. When the day of Pentecost came, Luke wouldn't have just said they were together. Let me tell you, by the way, this is for your information. The material that these guys were using to write what you call the Bible now, they were too expensive. They were unaffordable. Most likely, the document, the, the material that Luke is using to write Acts and what he has used to write Luke he has a sponsor, the man called Theophilus. Maybe that is the man who has bought the scroll, the scroll 
and the ink, because these things are unaffordable in that day and time. They are not even available. And the scroll of Luke and Acts, that should be the longest scroll in the New Testament. So why is he telling us? Why is he using so many words? Why? He could have said they were together. Or he could have said they were all in one place. But how else? How else can this be emphasized? Look at how important it is for brothers and sisters to be together. To be all together in one place. Not one or two. But all of them. Not just together in the spirit. But in one place. All of them. So Peter is not in the northern side of Jerusalem. And Bartholomew on the other side, on the southern, and James and John on the east, and Matthew on the west. No, they are all together in one place, all together in one place. And then the Spirit came. There are the implications here, serious implications here. We have a church today in today's world that doesn't understand these things doesn't understand this economics, doesn't understand what God is doing. We have a church that is not interested in the economy and in the technology that God uses to, to, to spread the gospel. We have a church where men and women are just interested with, with their needs. I go to church for God to touch me. To touch me. And it has got nothing to do with God's mission. They were there, all of them, present. They continued in prayer, in one mind, present. All of them, the men, the 12 of them, and the women, they were there. They were present. Tell your neighbor, they were present. Please, 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 tell them again. They were present. Yeah. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 120 of them. The 12 and the women. Yes, marginalized by the whole city. Yes, a minority. Judged by the religious leaders to be fanatics and, uh, and, and people of divisions. Persecuted, mistreated, fearful. But Luke tells us they were all together. In one place. Says your vision. Says your vision. Because this vision is radical. This is a radical vision. And you know what? Me, I think, I think I've been praying. I, I've been praying and, and asking God, God, do you really want to, to help your people grow and become, become people who can be tools in your hands? And yeah, the answer is yes, yes, yes. But God keeps on saying, but they don't want my process. People don't want my process. They, they, want, they want help. They want my help, but they want to get my help in their own terms. He keeps saying that. He keeps saying that. They want me to give them a job, but they are not, that job is not about me. That job is about them. That's it. That's what I'm hearing in prayer. When I pray, when I bend my knee and because I know all the needs represented here and I'm praying and, and I'm praying and, and I'm praying and I keep praying and every time yeah, 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 keep praying but, but my people don't want my process. They want, they want me to bless them but they want me to bless them on their own terms. Not on my terms. <laughs> And so you stay there for a very long time without a job, waiting. You know, miserable. You, your life is miserable because you feel, you feel the world is coming up against you. And you continue to feel miserable because you are not aligning. Aligning your life with the will and with the purpose of God. And God's hands are tied. God's hands are 
are tired. You can't do nothing because you are not in for the process. You want your own process. You are all together in one place. Waiting for God. All together in one place waiting for God, the Holy Spirit to come. Now, pastor, the Holy Spirit can come in my bedroom. Na kwanini yauna? Kwanini yauna? No, pastor, the Holy Spirit can come upon me when I'm flying to Mombasa. Na kwanini anjakuja? No, pastor, the Holy Spirit can come upon me when I'm holidaying in Masai Mara. You know, the Holy Spirit can come upon me when I'm sleeping in my bed and I cannot wake up. Na kwanini anjakuja? Akutoe kwa yoshida. Oh, together in one place. It's the economy of God. It's the economy of God. These guys are marginalized. They are persecuted. They are a minority in Jerusalem. The religious leaders are looking at them and they are thinking, these are fanatics. If anything, their leader was arrested a few weeks ago and killed and murdered. And now they are lying to us that he was raised from the dead. That's how they are being filled in Jerusalem. Why do we make Christianity look so nice? Christianity right from the beginning was not a nice thing. It was not a nice thing. Christianity from the beginning, people did not like it. Because these guys were known to be fanatics. Fanatics of a certain gospel, of a certain man who died a few weeks ago, and now they are claiming he's, he's now raised from the dead and he's gone up into heaven. It, that's fanaticism. Christianity is not a nice religion. And we try to make it nice. We try to meet people and make it, make, make, you know, make people want to hear Jesus. We try to be as nicest as possible. By the way, I said, I'm going to tell you. You are nice. Apana, 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 apana. Hata ukiwa nice bando wa hata kubali. Mtu wakuma. Apana, wekelea mawe. Wekelea ma corrections na ma rebukes. Because that's what Christianity is. Ingine ni motivation. The gospel is, they were all together in one place, waiting for the presence of the Holy Spirit, waiting for the power to come from on high. And there, they were utterly one. One praying having fellowship, being instructed, encouraged, emboldened, inexperienced, yes. Fearful, of course they were. But you know what? They waited. They waited. Even wondering whether it is time to call it quits. But they waited. They waited. Ask your neighbor, what have you been waiting for? Okay, have a conversation. Have a conversation. Have a conversation. What have you been waiting for? I've been waiting for. Oh, Pastor, I've been waiting for a job. It is not coming, you know. I feel so miserable. I don't know what to do. Nobody is replying my emails. I've sent like a million and one in replies and um, wait. And above everything else, can you wait for the spirit? Don't wait for an employer. Wait for the spirit. Stop waiting for a reply. Wait for the spirit above everything else. Prepare your heart. Prepare your mind. Sanctify yourself. Clean your heart. Clean your mind. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. Stop waiting for an email. Stop waiting for an ambassador. The ambassador will come, but it will only come because you are waiting for something else, not the ambassador. You wait for the impressor, you become miserable because, because nobody is sending. Nobody is sending. Nobody. You wait for email. Yeah, you wrote that application. You felt, wow, I qualify for this. I am the man. I am the man. May the employer never see any other email. May they see mine. You know, that's how Pentecostals pray. Hapa, wagonjwa, wagonjwa wakili na moyo. May this email be the only one that will appear in that computer. I have had those prayers. Instead of people waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
They are waiting for an email to come back to confirm, yes, come for the interview. And then it stays for two months. And nobody replies to you. And then you are in your bed. And you cannot wake up. Why? Oh, why are you not waking up? Because I'm disappointed. Why are you disappointed? Because the company did not send me an email, an inv invite. Or because the company sent me a... Re I regret. Because you were waiting for the wrong thing. Wait in Jerusalem, but wait for the right thing. Don't wait for a husband. Wait for the Holy Spirit. He may as well come with a husband. Don't wait for a wife. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Prepare your heart and your mind. You know, fatten, fatten your life with the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God. Have the Word of God clean you so that the Spirit can have a place to come and dwell. And who knows, as he comes, he may come with those things that you are waiting for. Wait. Wait. Pentecost believers and believers who wait. Pentecostal charismatic believers don't wait. They want it now, at this moment. Now and here. And that's why we make those kind of prayers. I claim him now. I claim it now. I decree and declare I own that car. I own that house. And you're only 12. Again. Wait. Pentecost believers are people who wait, have an experience with the Spirit. Number two. These are implications of Pentecost. Number two. To be a Pentecost believer is to be filled and have an experience with the Holy Spirit. To be a Pentecost believer is to be filled and to have an experience with the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 2 to 4. Suddenly, and suddenly, you know, you know, I me, I love, I love the Bible. That's why Mimi, Mimi, I'm wezi mukani toa kwa Biblia. I'm wezi. Ata mungi zaga ni kifani kapa levi, pa levi, pa levi. Jama amu etu ku kufua mutu. Ata kufua na yende zake. Come and God, are you present? Siko, siko. As they waited, suddenly. Look at those, look at those two ones. As they waited, suddenly. Look at that. Suddenly. Because that's how God answers our prayers. You can wait for three months. You can wait for nine years. You can wait for ten years. But there shall be a suddenly. There shall be a suddenly. If you are waiting, it's a waiting of fruitfulness. You're not waiting, sleeping, and crying. Your waiting is a waiting of fruitfulness. There shall be a suddenly in your life. Suddenly, a sound like a violent wind blowing came from heaven and filled the entire house where they were sitting. And tongues of fire, defined in tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Look at that. Look at that. When the day of Pentecost came, that's what happened. All at once, out of the blues. Have you, have you ever heard of that? Have you ever heard of that statement? Out of the blues. Mostly we use it when we are not talking something nice. Out of the blues. This guy comes and he begins to insult me. Out of the blues. Out. We can also have the other out of blues. Out of the blues. Out of the blues. 
This company, I sent and emailed them three years ago. Out of the blues. Out of the blues. Someone comes and we are in love and six months down the line. See, Muzeme, amen. Vandanda. Now, and Out of the blues. But this one is among greater, bigger, out of the blues because out of the blues, like a massive helicopter passing through the building here, they heard a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Mighty rushing wind. It filled their small house. And then they appeared what looked like defined tongues of fire or even or even flames now 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 you know i the, nowadays i take I, I go very slow when i'm reading the bible so that i may observe things that i've never seen before you know if you're a preacher like me and a theologian like me you can easily become so acquainted with the bible that you don't read it you know it you just know it you just know it so as i was reading this this time round I saw this. Look at this. I saw this. There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Okay? And then verse 3, and defining tongues as of fire appeared to them. And I even wondered, I was just sitting on my table and I wondered, who puts wind and fire in the same sentence? Who puts mighty rushing wind and fire on the same sentence. This is dangerous. Something dangerous was happening in Jerusalem that morning. It says it's before 9 a.m. But something dangerous. Something, you know, in, in, here in Kenya, we do not have a problem with, uh, with forest fires. So you, many of you will not know, but at least you, are, you might have seen one on the, fee, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the news. We lived in Cape Town. Goodness me. And, and, and when, 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 when it is summer, when it is summer, and there's so much, much wind on the mountains, and those trees are, are rubbing against one another, or even a smoker passes by and throws something into the forest, and then that fire is, is lit. That's fire you cannot stop. You have seen that on TV. You must. Australia and the US, especially Australia, is known for fires that go for months and they cannot be stopped. Why? Because there is rushing wind and there is fire. Something dangerous is happening in Jerusalem on that morning of the Pentecost. And this, these tanks, these what looked like tanks of fire, they sat on each one of them. They sat on each one of them. 120, there was a cloth of fire over their head. He sat on them. And as they sat on them, those, 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 those tanks, those tanks of fire filled them with the Holy Spirit. And they empowered them for what God was, was just about to do in Jerusalem that morning. That morning, he, 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 the, he, the Spirit, came upon them like tongues of fire, sat upon them. He came into them, and through that, God prepared them for what he was going to do in Jerusalem that morning. That morning, and what was that? They began to speak in other tongues. They began to speak in other languages. They began to speak in other languages. In other words, when the day of Pentecost came, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had an experience of the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit. There was an explosion in Jerusalem. Let me tell you, this is not the only feeling of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit we have in the book of Acts. And in the New Testament, there are many others. There are many others. When he came, he began, he began, he began to come. He doesn't stop from coming. He constantly went on to come and to come and to come and to come and to come. He never stopped coming. Look, look, tells us, look, tells us, John and Peter before the Sanhedrin in chapter 4. And they are being questioned 
Why? Question. Why are you preaching in the name of Jesus Christ? They are being threatened. They are being told, no, you cannot use that name here. Yeah. Peter tells us, Luke tells us in 4.8. 4.8, he tells us. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. It's there. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, saying to them, rulers of the people and elders. Can you hear? He is no scandal. These are big men. These are big men. These are religious leaders. These are the archbishops and the arch apostles and, and, and all these men, men of the cloth all over the place, but they carry no power. These are those kind of men and, and they are questioning Peter and they are asking Peter, why preach in that name? Because you are causing, you are causing Afok in Jerusalem because of the Pentecost power and spirit. It doesn't say, and Peter began to mumble. And Peter began to wonder what he's going to say. No, 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 no. It just says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, saying to them, rulers of people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed to, done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? He says, let it be known to all. Let it be known to all. That is a man who is filled of the Holy Spirit. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel. The whole nation. Let the whole nation hear and know that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Peter has just been filled by the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost. And now he is in the business of witnessing. He's in the business of witnessing. Let it be known that this man has been healed not by my power, not by my strength, but in the name, in the name, in the name of who? In the name of the man who commissioned them to become disciples. You see that? You see why Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> it's a stupid thing that has been happening in the world for many years that we see on the TV people are filled with the Holy Spirit and they, began, they begin laughing. <laughs> Did you see that? Have you seen those things? Have you seen those things? Those chaos, chaotic things? Somebody laughs for two hours. <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen to me. When the Holy Spirit fills you, you become a witness. You don't start laughing. Then they are threatened not to preach again in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they go into prayer. They go into prayer. Prayer and the Holy Spirit. Those two things. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you people. Me, I love you so much. But let me tell you that. If you think you can bear and carry the Holy Spirit without prayer in your life, you are lying. In fact, those tongues you have, if they are not birthed from a place of, of, from a place of prayer, they are fake. They are not true. They are threatened. And then they go into prayer. And they pray for boldness. They pray for boldness. To continue to preach in a place where they have been threatened. First that one. First that one says of chapter 4 says. And when they had prayed. And when they had prayed. And when they had prayed. The place in which they were gathered together was shaken. The place was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. With boldness. How, how, comes, how comes you tell us you have the gift of the Holy Spirit, but you are so scared. You cannot tell anyone about Jesus Christ. You cannot preach even to your cat or dog. As you practice how to preach. How comes? How comes? How comes you can't give a testimony? How comes you cannot stand somewhere and give a testimony and say, yeah, it's Jesus and Jesus wants this. And Jesus wants that. How comes? You tell us you are filled of the Holy Spirit, yet you cannot say something about Jesus Christ? No, no, no. You are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you are filled with a godly spirit. Or something like that. He prayed. They prayed. And as they prayed, the place was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know what? They continued. They did not start loving. They continued to speak the word with boldness, boldness, boldness. Look at 
Luke tells us of another feeling. Saul, Saul, when God calls Saul, Saul, sorry, when God calls Saul, he is filled of the Holy Spirit. And I think it's in chapter 9 or 13, Paul meets with a Jewish witch called Baal Jesus or Elimas. I think it's up chapter 13. Elimas tries to stop the governor because, because I think it's Damascus. If I'm not wrong, Paul's is in Damascus. The governor, Sergius Paulus, wants to hear the gospel. And so he invites, he invites Paul. There you go. You got it. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimas, can you say Elimas? Yeah. But Elimas, the magician, that's a witch. For that is the meaning of his name. <laughs> Opposed them, speaking, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, so that was but Elimas. Now we have but Saul. Yeah, I, I want some but Sauls here. Here in this place. But Saul, who was also called Paul. Look at the next statement. Filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked intently. I'm going to begin to do that. Oh God, help me. Looked intently at Helimus. And said, you son of the devil. Where? Will I say that one? You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight parts of the Lord? And then he pronounces a judgment. He says, and now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon Helemas, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the heart. That's what happens when the Spirit fills you, and there is opposition. You cause Afok. The Pentecost is about violence, but spiritual violence. Spiritual violence. That's why it is described with violent language. That's what Pentecost is about. Pentecost, Pentecost is about God bringing in the nations. I will say something about that in a moment. And nations cannot come softly. They cannot come softly. They, nations, nations, nations. The Akikuyus and the, and the Luos and, and the Kambas and the, and the Luyas. And the, they cannot just come softly. They need some power. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. You cannot, you cannot preach to some place, preach in some places unless there is God's power of the Holy Spirit upon you. You can't. You can't. You can't. When I was young, immediately after high school, and I was, I was, I was, I was so bad, and I preached in our village for about six months. For about six months. And, and they tried all they could using witches, witches, witches. And, and my feeling was, was backward, backward, completely. No water, no nothing, no food. When there is famine, that was where famine was fouled. And I got saved in high school, in my second year, and I, and I came back home and I began to preach, and it was crazy preaching, crazy, crazy. Kupambana na waze, ambawa, mebeba. Urogi na uchawi. And I was preaching in the marketplace every Sunday. Every Sunday afternoon. And it's confronting a witch after another. I would wake up from my small grass thatched house. That was my, that was my house. That was my house. Grass thatched house. Ukuchini na ukuju. And I would wake up early in the morning as I get out. I can see some people were here. And they were trying to do something. To me. Because. Because the truth is within three years. <laughs> within three years there were no witches. Three years. 
three years. But the gospel was hidden. And then we have made this thing so cool. We have made the gospel so cool. The gospel is not cool. It's not. It's warfare. It's warfare. Wait until we begin to teach on Genesis. And, and I will show you. I will show you where, where warfare starts. Because we think warfare starts with Jesus. The gospel preaching is warfare. Gospel preaching and gospel believing. You know, for you to believe the gospel, that this is what God tells me to do. It's warfare because your mind is going against it. Your heart and mind is, is going against what I'm preaching now. And so it's warfare. You must, you must say amen. And not just amen now. Even tomorrow, amen. And on Wednesday, amen. I believe the word of God. The Bible says I wait. So I will not worry. The word of God on Sunday said I wait. And therefore I will wait. I choose to believe the word of God. I will not believe what the employer has said. I will not believe the regret email. I will believe the word of God. That's, that's warfare. That's warfare. That's warfare. That's warfare. That's warfare. That's warfare. You get the doctor's report. You get the doctor's report. You go back home and continue waging warfare against what you have heard. Your organs, they are not functioning. Your mind is going crazy and your legs and your womb and your, and your stomach and your lungs and your heart. All oh, these reports, it's warfare. It's warfare. It's warfare. Warfare. It's warfare. And I'm here to teach you warfare. Because the Bible is about warfare right from Genesis chapter 3. Chapter 6, chapter 12, Joshua. The whole book of Joshua is fighting and fighting. And who are these people being fought? The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Hites. And there are like seven of those Hites in Joshua. In Deuteronomy, in Joshua. It's warfare. It's warfare. It's warfare. Every sign. When your mind is getting sick, and you're no longer believing the gospel, it's warfare. You stand up. You pronounce the word of God against what is happening in your mind. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Let me tell you, because young people, young people in our day and time are, I think I'm, I'm beat more than us, older people. Young people. Young people. Excuse me. You are more beat than older people like us. We are, we are the ones who are supposed to be beat by the world. But many of you are so beat. So beat. So beat. And the things that are beating you are so small. I can text to from the boyfriend. I don't like you anymore. I took one church for two weeks. I took one church because a boyfriend said, I don't like you anymore. You, you don't have muscles. You are useless. You can't, you can't help your life. You can't help your life. You can't help your, What if it happens in a marriage? And your husband comes and he tells you, you know what? I want a divorce. What will you do? If you are crying and dying when it's a boyfriend. And now it's a marriage. And your husband who comes one of the days with a nice young girl, and he tells you, you know what? Park and leave. What will you do? What do you do? Those are things that happen, happen here on the earth. They don't happen in heaven. They happen here on the earth. Those are not movies. I'm telling you things that happen. What will you do? What will you do? Life is warfare, guys. You've got to fight. You've got to wear garments of fighting and warfare. I don't know who will, help, who will help you. It's not your mother. It's not your father. There's something about your life. It's warfare. That's life. That's what life is about. And I've been, personally, I've been to serious, serious situations in my life. And I keep going. And many of you will know that. I keep going. I'm not praising myself. But let me tell you this. I have learned from when I am very young 
I learned from high school days when I used to preach in the village. I learned for me to survive and for me to be able to live, I must wear garments of warfare. Garments of warfare. Because everything is against that. But let's, let's not do church. Just the way church has been done. Nice songs. You know, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Do you what? No. It's warfare. It's warfare. It's warfare. It's warfare. Demons are small things. Demons are not big things. There are things called principalities and powers. Those are bigger. Those are greater. And those principalities and powers have got to do with your mind. Forget about demon. A demon comes to give you sickness or something like that. To harass you. That's what you see in Jesus in the Gospels. A demon will come to harass you. And cause pain. Kicha and those kind of things. That is small time. There are other things called principalities and powers. These are gods. These are territorial rulers. These are, these, are the, these are the spirits that rule our mind. Such that you try to love Jesus, you cannot. You try to love Jesus, you try to address your mind so that it can be aligned with the word of God. You cannot. You know why? Because there is a principality that has been set against you. And so you cannot, you cannot win your battle against that principality over and in your mind by just sitting there and, you know, the pastor prays for me. You know, you know let's go to church. You know, I will go to church when I want. You know, to, ah, this week I am so tired. Sunday, I can rest on Sunday. Utakufa. Utakufa. Tani. Anakukalia hivi. Kukukalia. Kukalia. Because even coming for a corporate gathering like this, it's warfare. It's warfare. It's warfare because the thing that happens here on a Sunday morning cannot happen in your bedroom. Cannot happen in your house. It can't. It's warfare. And so if you cannot see it as a warfare and wake up early in the morning at 6 a.m. to begin to prepare, prepare your heart, prepare your mind and uh, just be ready, ready for the Holy Spirit to work. If you can't do that, you will come here and you go back the way you came. There's nothing happening. There's nothing happening. Yeah, I'm telling you and I'm giving you. These are skills. You will not get this from university. These are skills from the spirit that will help you to become a fighter in this life. It doesn't matter where you have come from. Because, because I'm seeing with many young people, when they don't have money, they don't have a job, they don't have a boyfriend, they don't have a girlfriend, you find them miserable. Miserable. Nagulangumu. Lunch. Doa kwa kioski. Nachukua ngumu. Ngumu. Unajua ngumu? Unajua ngumu hivi? Unarundi kwa nyumba. Unakukula. Nakula na unaendelea kucheza hiyo. Jioni. Jioni nafika. Unaendelea ngumu ingine. Umekaliwa vimbaya. Vimbaya. Umekaliwa. Vimbaya. Nasikiza. Nyinyi ndiyo mtasaindia hao vijana. Nyinyi. Nyinyi vijana mko hapo. Muamuke. Muamuke. Ndiyo maana naongea njiyo hizi vitu. Kunjaswa na romu takatifu. Muamuke tuende tusaindia hao vijana. Na wamecha hapa thika. Hii thika wamecha hapa. MKU. KMTC. Na hizi colleges zimecha hapa. Wamecha hapa. Wamecha hapa. Juzi nimepitia town usiku. Usiku. Wasichana wananisimamisha hivi. Wanataka mumbaba. Tumefaa tunguwa tumefika. Natafuta sponsor. Nini mupone ndiyo munisa indie tuponyeshe wengine. Unasikia? Hiyo ndiyo kuwa mission no. Hiyo ndiyo mission no. Lakini sasa utaenda mission no ukiwa we ni mugonjwa, we mmoja wa wale wanakula ngumu. Utaenda kusaindia mwingine wa ngumu haji. 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 Inambindi kwanza ukobolewe na hiyo maisha. Ukobolewe na hiyo maisha. Ndiyo sasa tushikane kama hawa. Kama hawa wase. Tushikane. All together in one place. And there's nothing that can stop.
top of them. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they cause havoc in the city, Jerusalem. They cause havoc. One day, one day, everybody thinks they are drunk, but they are not drunk. They are full of the Holy Spirit and they are ready to cause chaos in the whole city and they cause it. They cause chaos. Even the leaders of the people, the rulers of the people cannot stand Peter and John because he is full of the Holy Spirit. Where is this? Where is this in our day and time? Where is this in our day? We are watching people die. We are watching people, young people commit suicide. We are watching young people getting confused. Relationships is what everybody is talking about. That boy, that girl, and they are killing one another. And so many evil. Naivasha. Do you know what is happening in Naivasha this weekend? Do you know who is in Naivasha? You think it's older people like us? Who is in Naivasha? Don't think, watch a kwenda mbali sana in your mind. Stay close. These are your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your cousins. These ones. They are in that life. They are in that life. And now you, you think, you know, no, you've got to be nice. Just be nice. Just be nice to her. Just be good to her. No, don't be so nini. No. And pole pole and you are No! No, I come in the power of the Holy Spirit and I will rebuke and correct you and tell you the gospel. That's what will heal you. It's not my softness. It's not my softness. That's what will heal people. Yeah, number three. Number three. That was not in the notes. Number three. Number three. To be a Pentecostal believer. To be a Pentecostal believer is to bear an expanded vision. Is to have an expanded vision. Is to have an expanded vision of your life. To be a Pentecost believer is to bear and it's to have a bigger vision. Is to have a big vision that outlives you. That outlives you. A vision that requires power and capacity. A vision that you cannot resource. To be a Pentecost believer is to bear an expanded vision. You see, the events of Pentecost are events that have a long history. History. God called Abraham in Genesis 12. And he told him, I will bless you. I will bless you. He told Abraham, I will make you a big multi-ethnic family. He told Abraham, I will make you a great nation so that it could be a blessing. That's what he told Abraham in Genesis in Genesis 12. Pentecost is admittedly the launching of that vision. That vision that God gave Abraham 4,000 years ago. Pentecost is the launching of this vision. To be a, to be a Pentecost believer is to bear this vision. Is to be, become a participant of this vision of God. It is to embody the vision. It is to embody the vision of God that says, I have called you to be a blessing. That, friends, that, that is the vision of God. The vision of God is not, I have called you so that I can bless you. Of course, he will bless you, but that's not the vision. The vision is, I have called you so that I may bless you, so that you may be a blessing. That is the vision of God. Now, that requires some guts for it to be man manifested. Why? Because this is a vision, this is a vision that is not restricted to ethnicity. That, this is a vision that is not restricted to gender, to language, to class, to nationality, to race, to tribe, to education, to location, to geography, to whatever. This is God's vision and it doesn't care about class. God doesn't care whether you have money or not. If his Holy Spirit is upon you. Remember, do you remember John, Peter and John at the door, at the gate to the temple? And there is a crippled man. He has been there for years since he was born. And he is lifting up his hand to Peter and John. And Peter and John, what are they telling the man? Silver and gold. 
we do not have. Because the vision of God is not a vision of silver and coins and money. Tell you the truth. Tell you the truth. God's vision is not about those things. It's not about class. It's not about gender. God's vision doesn't care whether you're a woman or a man. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you cause half hawk. God's vision doesn't care where you come from. Even if you come from where? Come in and day. You know where is that? God's vision doesn't care about that. Even if you come from where? I have seen funny names here in Central. Very funny names of places here in Muranga. Even if you come from that village, God's vision doesn't care as long as you have his spirit. Doesn't care about geography. Doesn't care about gender. Doesn't care about ethnicity, whether you are a Kikuyu, a Kamba, whatever you are. It doesn't care. God's vision is great. Does not depend on those things. It depends on the spirit. Just have, have him. Have him and you will see how things begin to happen. In your life. You must have an expanded vision. An expanded vision. An expanded vision. When the spirit came on the day of Pentecost. The gospel. The gospel was for everyone. The gospel was for everyone. In those days. In those days. In Judaism. In Judaism. The, go, the, the, the message, the relationship between, with God. Was between just a few people. Only a few people would go into the presence of God and they were all men. They were all men. When Pentecost came, that boundary was broken. Was totally broken. It was totally broken. The gospel was for everyone. When the day of Pentecost came, the gospel is for every human being. When the day of Pentecost came, the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the more you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the wider the mission God will give you. Pentecost is not about feeling good and cozy. Pentecost is not about warm, warm and, and fuzziness in prayer meetings. No, Pentecost. Pentecost is much more than that. Pentecost is noisy, mighty, rushing weed. Pentecost is noisy. It's a noisy shake-up. Of our very being and the world around us. I don't know what is your image of Pentecost. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what is your image of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't know what your Sunday school teacher taught you. But that's what the Bible says. Noisy. Not noise of declaring and owning other people's property. And claiming people's husbands. No, that's not the noise. That's a Pentecostal charismatic noise. I'm not talking about that noise. I'm talking about the noise, the noise that gives birth, the noise that delivers young people from drugs and drug abuse and, and sex and, 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 and drugs and all these things. I'm talking about that noise, the noise of giving birth. That's what I'm talking about. That's what is happening in Jerusalem that day. Noise, noise of the Holy Spirit. While people are being born again. That day. That day. We will see it in the next passage. That day. 3,000 of them. Joined. The story of God. 3,000 of them. Joined the story. And they were going to leave the city. Because they had come for the feast. They only come for the feast of the, of, the, of the harvest, the feast of the weeks. They will now leave and go back to their diaspora, to their nations. They will now leave and go back to Babylon and to, and to Persia and to Italy and to Libya in our own Africa here. They will now leave and as they leave, they will go and take the gospel there. That's why when Paul goes into some of these cities like Thessalonica and Philippi, he finds believers there and Rome. Where did they come from? The day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. I don't know. I don't know whether you can feel the need of the Holy Spirit in your life. Look, if you can't feel that need, you are still not born again. You are not born again. But if 
see you're born again, there should be such a prayer as we finish. God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. But you must have a vision. You cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you may just love your wife or your, or your husband. No, 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 no. No, there's much more. You need to cause some chaos in your own environment. Some chaos in your own environment. That's it. That's the purpose. To be witness. To be witness. You may start it with your wife and with your husband and with your cousin and with your daughter and with your son. But the Holy Spirit is coming upon you so that you may be witness. 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 So can you stand up and and try to... They prayed. They prayed. You know, they were threatened. They were threatened. And they were released. And then they went back together. All of them together in one place. Chapter 4 of Acts. And they prayed. They prayed. They prayed. And as they were praying, the place was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak. They continued to speak the good news with boldness and courage. They prayed. Maybe you can try that. Maybe you can try that. Maybe you can try that. Maybe you can try that.